14 verses 1 to 42. And what we have is at the same time both the most glorious and most horrendous events in the life of our Lord. Jesus had said to his mother in times in the past, my hour has not yet come. When the Gentiles come seeking Jesus, he then says, now my hour has come to be glorified. Now we will see in a very bizarre way what the glory of God is really all about. And oddly enough, the crucifixion does not take up all of the space even in this chapter. We have first of all the events before Pilate, and then not a whole lot about Jesus being taken to the place of crucifixion. Events that take place down below him, a few of the things of what happens at the feet with the uh, soldiers and some with his mother and his thirst and then his burial. These are events where we might think that Jesus is not in control and he has willingly given himself over but at no time in the Gospel of John does he do this against his will. This is the will, this is the heart of God. God knows what it will take for us to be restored to the glory to have the Spirit reconnected with us, and so Jesus willingly goes and does all of this in our stead. Pilate is presented in the Gospel of John as the unwilling participant. He is not apparently very interested in trying to put Jesus to death. He is not seeing this as a way where he can please someone else, but as every time he tries to make an attempt to stop what's going on, uh, the uh, Jewish leaders keep pushing him to the wall and trying and try to convince him that if he does not do this he will not be a friend of Caesar and if he does not do this he will be allowing one who has said that he himself is a king to be ruling instead of the King Tiberius who uh, or the Caesar Tiberius who uh, himself at this time was very afraid that someone else wanted to take over for him. Uh, the real truth of the matter here is that when Jesus says, Behold the man, or I'm sorry, when Pilate says, Behold the man, he is saying something about Jesus that is much deeper than even he could know. Here is the true human being. Here is the one who really is everything that God intended for humans to be. And yet Pilate himself, mentioned in the Apostles' Creed as the one who delivers Jesus over to death, not the Pharisees and not the scribes, Pilate himself is now the one who will unwittingly or on purpose uh, finally do the deed and give the official Roman sanction to the end of our Lord's life. Pilate seems to operate out of fear. He, we can't be sure exactly who he's afraid of. Uh, he does not seem to be afraid of Jesus at all. And uh, Jesus' rejoinder to him will sort of say, I'm the only one that you need to respect uh, it is from above, from my Father, in essence, though he doesn't say that clearly, from my Father that you have the authority, not just from the Roman Empire. And you really ought to be seeing that what you are doing is only because another has given you authority. You do not act on your own. Uh, in the Roman Empire, there was no one official set of rules and laws, though. The one who was representing Rome, Pilate here, is really given the final authority and though in matters of the Roman concern he would have to ask for permission to do something if it was simply to maintain the peace he finally had the uh, ability to do that in whatever way he would. Uh, Pilate is afraid basically of losing his position. He is afraid of any riots. Uh, he is known as many other leaders in that time period as being ruthless when it uh, was convenient for him. He may at first try not to go along with what the Jews are saying simply because he does not want them to think that he can be manipulated by them. But they know which button to push. They know what to say to him to get him to think more about his own skin rather than about uh, that of, the, of Jesus. And so um, kind of shows here, as so often in the scriptures, that self-interest is the final deciding factor. What's in it or not in it for me? 
And the Jewish leaders, again, are seeing Jesus as a terrible threat to them because if people listen to him, then they are exposed. And Pilate, without not wanting to expose, or without trying to expose himself, is shown also here to be one who operates out of his own interest. And so Jesus is treated as finally less important than Pilate. Uh, he does not have any principles that he has to stand for. Uh, he knows that it's one against many, and if he argues in favor of uh, delivering Jesus even after the scourging and the flogging, uh, then he will uh, risk the fact that there may be a riot incited by the Jewish leaders. Uh, at this time, at Passover, there are about 100,000 people pro probably in Jerusalem, and so he decides that he is going to act uh, on his own uh, authority to protect himself. Later, a few years later, he will indeed be removed because he cannot control everything. Um, it, this is the day of preparation according to the Gospel of John, and about noontime when Jesus would have been crucified was the time when the Jewish families began their rite of preparation for the Passover by sacrificing or killing the sacrificial the um, animals, the Paschal lambs. Um, I should articulate more clearly than I just did that this is not a sacrifice in the sense of offering something to God. The Passover animal was eaten by the family, rem reminding them of when they fled out into the wilderness and escaped from all of the powers of Pharaoh. And so each year as they had that meal, they were reminding themselves of their deliverance. And uh, John shows very clearly that while everything else is going on, there is another one who is being sacrificed as well. And though John does not talk about the institution of the Lord's Supper, here our Lord is the one who says, through the bread and the wine, he will provide us with the food for our trek through the desert of this life until we finally are restored to be with our Lord, and that because he is with us, it is really not just desert. Um, the religious charges seem to be the predominant ones here. The Jews here try to say that uh, by our law, he has made himself to be something that is punishable by death. Pilate says, that's no concern of mine. You take care of it yourselves. Here, when it's convenient for them, they, the Jewish leaders say, no, we have to uh, go along with Roman rule. We cannot put someone to death. Uh, they obviously did stone uh, Stephen not long after this, and uh, James, brother of the Lord, was put to death for uh, being a leader of the church. But at this point, they will play into Pilate's hands and simply threaten him with a riot if he doesn't go along with them. Um, it may be that the reason why Jesus is now uh, flogged here is that he that Pilate hopes maybe that that which was itself a punishment, uh, 39 lashes with this horrible whip was enough to tear the flesh to ribbons. And um, it may be that Pilate hoped that they would be moved by this to say, well, that's enough. Okay, just let him go and uh, maybe he has learned his lesson. Uh, it probably also contributed to Jesus' death that uh, he would have had a significant loss of blood, but uh, that didn't work. Uh, Pilate probably, as I've said, fears Rome the most, and uh, John almost talks as if Pilate is enslaved in fears, that no matter what he does, he knows that he is caught, and uh, I think exposes to all human beings the dilemmas that we have, that if we are not motivated by the love of the Lord, then all we can do is bounce from one fear to the next and try to cover up one fear with another one. Uh, in the questioning and answering, when Pilate talks with Jesus, uh, Jesus is really answering on a much different level than Pilate's asking. Pilate says, are you a king? And uh, Jesus' response lets Pilate know that the kingship is not really what Pilate would understand. It is a whole different way of ruling than what Pilate would know. A ruling not out of power and out of fear, but out of settledness and out of love and out of God opening his heart to draw all people to himself rather than trying to keep them down and keep them oppressed and keep them doing something simply because he has told them to do so. Uh, where Jesus is taken then to be crucified as the hour has come,
is identified as being very close to the city and there is uh, significant discussion in archaeological circles about where the walls of Jerusalem would have been at this time and where uh, Golgotha would have been. If you go to Jerusalem today, you find that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, formerly called the Church of the Resurrection, is well within the old city of Jerusalem, but apparently there was a second wall uh, before the third wall was put up to extend the city further, a second wall that just kind of went north and just went just outside of the area where uh, Jesus would have been crucified. Um, the early church leader Origen tells us that an early tradition said that that was the same place where Adam had been buried. And um, as I think I've mentioned, there are even depictions of the blood from Jesus uh, dropping down onto Adam's grave in, in uh, art. Uh, nothing at the time is mentioned about that. Uh, some others had a couple of other places where they thought Adam was buried. Uh, some at Machpelah where Abraham was later buried. Some thought at uh, up on the Temple Mountain underneath the Holy of Holies. Uh, so there are all sorts of traditions and uh, I'm not going into hardly any of those traditions or all the different theories but uh, the material on what happens in these last days of Jesus' life is just immense. And people over the centuries have taken every little tidbit of what we find in the Gospels and uh, tried to figure out what does this mean. And uh, There is a literal meaning to things and then symbolic meanings. Uh, whether the place of the skull has any more meaning or uh, the fact of the kind of drink that Jesus was given or the importance of the spices or who, is, who it is who takes Jesus and, uh, and uh, buries him, uh, and many other things uh, that are far beyond what we can look at right now. But um, among the other um, interesting sidelights, uh, it was said that in certain cases with crucifixion in the Roman Empire that the sentence was handed down and not to be executed for ten days. Others said that no more than one should be crucified on any one day. Uh, Alexander Janaeus, one of the Jewish kings whose father had been a Hasmonean priest, a priest of the family of Hasmonius, uh, Alexander Janaeus actually crucified 800 all at once. I believe they were Pharisees who were calling his rule into question. And uh, so we can find all sorts of different practices just because something was declared to happen or should happen a certain way doesn't mean it did. Uh, the inscription that we have then is an inscription uh, as a legal document sometimes nailed up above the cross sometimes to be worn around the neck of the prisoner uh, to say to everybody here's what was done uh, apparently to say if you act in this same way then you also are going to have the same consequence for you uh, it may be in fact that Jesus was crucified naked and some said that there was even a peg that one was set upon uh, all whatever kind of humiliation and mockery one could come up with. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, suffering on the cross is not really described in a lot of detail. Uh, sometimes Christians will try to magnify what Christian response to Jesus' death ought to be by, by graphically detailing all of the terrible things that Jesus went through physically and then saying, now with all of that that he did, how can you not do something back? But uh, the scriptures really do not do a whole lot of that. Um, here we have Jesus uh, crying out that he is thirsty and uh, taking care of his mother and uh, making sure that the beloved disciple usually identified with John will take care of her. Uh, we are told that uh, not in this case that everything is fulfilled, but that everything is complete. And so uh, Jesus will uh, say that everything is completed now, that all of what's necessary for our restoration is completed. We must recognize that in the Gospels it is more than just Jesus' punishment to give us a model for how we should suffer in this world, but that the glory of God, particularly in John, is seen in that God is, is willing to tear himself apart so that the Father is torn apart from the Son as Jesus is crucified here and that the result is that God is alive on Good Friday and yet God is dead in fact that Jesus is dead a separation 
and existing apart from God as the definition of death that Jesus takes in our stead here very willingly and knowingly and yet with the great agony. But the worst of the punishment is the uh, brokenness that takes place within God himself and here John describes it as the majesty of God also. Uh, Jesus is described here as a king, uh, even the sign tells us about that, and so some would see that here is his enthronement. Uh, he came to serve and to be given as a ransom for many, and this is the most majestic moment then uh, in a macabre sort of way for us as human beings, but yet theologically to see the great deep love that our Creator has for us in sending his Son to give us new life and to send the Spirit forth to love and care for us. Uh, the burial is described in a very royal kind of way with a huge amount of spices and uh, leaders being involved in the burial. Uh, Jesus as a uh, king, often with the connection made between kings and shepherds, shows how he cares for his flock, uh, for his mother here and the others, even at the time of his greatest agony. Uh, the uh, garment that he wears is not torn. We are told in other places that um, in Jewish tradition uh, God had given a garment, a special garment uh, to Moses and a special garment to Adam and a special garment to Joseph, one that was not torn and uh, it may be that the Jewish people would have heard some of these kinds of things where uh, the ones who had been the most righteous in serving God were giving were given special kinds of garments. Um, the uh, connection with the Spirit here, uh, we find out that uh, God has indeed uh, poured His Spirit out upon His Son, and yet now uh, the Spirit is uh, leaving Him, and He dies, and He will be buried, and yet the agony of that losing of that relationship is really also the victory. We find out in this that uh, many of the other traditions also that uh, we will not have time for uh, play into this in terms of the interpretation of the meaning. Uh, I might mention that some see that Eve, uh, or that Mary is a representative of the new Eve, uh, that the garden where Jesus was buried is a symbolic reference to the Garden of Eden or to Paradise. Uh, the, those kinds of issues uh, are all speculative. We need to see, first of all, that the most important element is that Jesus' death is his way of serving us, that his kingship is seen in his service, that the beloved Son who uh, is given up, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that that beloved Son, unlike Isaac, is not spared up on the mountain, often connected with that same uh, area around Jerusalem but that this one is given up in place of all, so that Jesus can be the one to restore the entire world to himself, to his Father, uh, under the care of the Spirit. Uh, we look now at the very end of Jesus' life, at the beginning of the victory, which will soon be proclaimed, and we recognize that in the midst of all the horror of being beaten, being mocked, having the thorns put upon him, having to be hung up on a cross and crucified with the most horrible kind of punishment, that at the very same time, God says, this is how much I have as love for you. The motivation for our Christian living is not simply to dwell on the terrible things that happened to Jesus and let those things then motivate us, that we feel sorry or we feel ashamed, but rather the Gospel of John tells us clearly that the Spirit has been poured out upon us, giving us that new life. We will see that very clearly as Jesus breathes on his disciples on Easter evening. And the motivation is not to dwell in what is wrong, but to take the promise of God's power upon us and let that motivate us also to go forth to say that the punishment for sin is finished and that new life has already begun for us. Uh, John uh, tells us that Nicodemus was told you need to be born from above, and the Lord who came down from above, and suffered and died and rose, is the one who now will uh, bring about that new birth, so that John lets us know that we are already living within 
our new eternal life. We are not just waiting for it, but we are living within that as what has been done in Jesus has been done for all of us. Uh, so even on this most tragic day, as we look at the tragedy of what happens to our Lord, we recognize that that is the day of his glory, the glory that came down and dwelt among us, was apparently hidden in flesh, but is revealed uh, already in what he does for us, but even more so in his resurrection. We will come together to celebrate that in our next lesson. Thank you very much. God go with you.